So this is a quick talk through controls and functions of a, an 8.5 SK. Um, first of all, drive and steering, uh, drive, forwards and reverse pedals. These are obvious things. But one thing to point out with hydrostatic is that the more you press down with the pedal, the more you will open the pump, which the, which the uh, engine is driving. So to actually, if you push the pedal all the way down, you've got a wide open pump, which isn't necessarily producing pushing force but it is producing speed. So to drive flat out, push your pedal down. To generate pushing force, be prepared to get it, have a play with your machine and get used to just lifting the pedal away from fully down to make sure that your engine is singing and it's working in a good position of torque and the pump isn't overwhelming the engine. We sometimes get reports from people saying that the engine's bogging down or is short of power and that's because they're basically just slamming the foot down treating it like an accelerator on a car and thinking that power is going to pull them out. It doesn't matter what you do with your throttle, which is this one here. Um, whatever position you've got that in, you can overwhelm your engine by just having the, the pedal flat down when you're on a really steep hill or when loading into material. So just get used to finding where the optimum position is on your foot for the different tasks that you do when you put your machine under severe load to actually get power and, t and pushing force and torque into your wheel motors rather than displacement which is speed steering obviously you're going to steer the machine with a steering wheel but this actuates um, a unit that turns this force into a straight line force so it's going to steer by pushing and pulling a steering cylinder if you're jerky with your steering wheel, you'll be really jerky with your steering action and you'll flick yourself around, flick your seat around. Try to get used to just teasing your steering. So you can steer fast, but just start it slow so that you, your, your cylinder doesn't just go bang into position and throw your cab around. So get a, try and get used to just being smooth with that. The same goes for all controls and especially when you look at your joystick with all the functions you've got this way, these are all proportional. So you, uh, sorry, you uh, lift your boom by pulling back, you lower your boom by pushing forwards, you crowd the headstock away by pushing away from you, and you crowd it back towards you by pulling towards you. These are, this is multifunctional, so multi-positional. You can do both boom and crowd functions together, and this is proportional, so get used to feeling this rather than throwing it around like this. Um, it's all proportional. Whilst we're on the joystick, telescope is this one here, which is a spring return switch. So that will telescope out, telescope in, release to the centre and it will stop. PTO is auxiliary functions for your attachments, on, off, on. So attachments have two different directions, especially if it's with a cylinder. One thing to note is if I leave the PTO switched on, so it's on at the moment, I turn my ignition on and you'll know that your PTO is on because you get this yellow light saying it's on. Starter is blocked. So that's a safety function so that when an attachment is actuated by accident, you can't then start your engine and have an attachment suddenly fire up and do some damage or do an injury. So you have to be attachment switched off PTO off, no light on. Start your engine. We've got two other switches here. High flow, that's this one here. And again, when you select a function, you'll always get a light. If I let the lights go off, you'll always get a light come on the dashboard. So that one's high flow, on, off. High flow is for the auxiliary functions. So related to PTO. High flow will pull a second gear pump into, uh, into, into flow, basically, to multiply the output to an attachment. So you'll get a higher flow rate and a faster spinning attachment if you're running a, a flail or something that spins. But if high flow is switched on, telescope also increases in speed because they actually share the oil flow from the same valve. Um, also, if high flow is switched on and you're using a grab, maybe a, a, a silage fork or a log grab or something like that, it'll suddenly become very snappy. 
So just be mindful. It's, it's not that difficult to just catch this while you're doing everything else. Um, and, and if you do switch it on, you're suddenly gonna get a very erratic grab and you're gonna get a very fast telescope. Then we've got DBS. So DBS and also this here, a link to the traction system on the machine. So again, if you switch DBS on, there's a light that comes on the display. Uh, DBS off basically means that the oil motor, the oil, oil, oil through the wheel motors will uh, pass through at whatever rate is required. So if I increase steering angle, my outside wheels want to turn faster than my inside wheels. So therefore my outside wheels will pull oil flow. My inside wheels will, uh, will not pull the oil flow. And so they'll all turn at the same speed. So I can do a figure of eight on a lawn, for example, with a lawn mower, and with DBS off, I won't have any t tearing or shearing effect on the grass with the wheels. So the only wheel or tire damage you can do is just impression rather than tearing. If I uh, leave DBS off and I go onto some slippery surface, or if I do some bucket loading with materials, I've now not got traction. So if one wheel actually breaks traction, it will pull oil flow from the others, and can leave you sat in a position where you've got a wheel spinning and no moving machine because the other three wheel motors are doing nothing. So to, in, to get, get traction, we switch DBS on. DBS on basically creates a situation where the front and rear wheel motors receive the same oil flow, so that's equalized, but the left to right uh, between the wheel motors, between each side, does have a differential. It's a limited form of differential. It's all done hydraulically, so it's not like a mechanical diff lock or anything like that um, but it means that when you steer you will get some resistance on your wheels and you will create some some tearing force but it's limited because there's, there's, there's still some differential left to right um, so that gives you the traction you need for loading you shouldn't need to do anything more than just put high, uh, put your uh, dbs on um, and use your pedal accordingly and lift off if you're overwhelming the machine um, but if you're in really, really sticky situations and you're losing traction and your wheels are, are, you know, are struggling in thick mud, then you can use that switch as well. There is no light for this switch, but if I've got DBS on and I squeeze the trigger whilst I'm still driving, so this is whilst I'm still moving and I've still got uh, tractive effort going on with the wheels. This, this isn't so effective if you stuck and you stop, but if you squeeze the trigger, You'll equalize the oil flow to all four wheel motors and you'll feel a pull of traction from the machine, which should get you out of any sticky situation. So that's called torque divider. That's called dynamic block system or DBS. With DBS off, the torque divider still pulls in, but it doesn't have the same effect. It has a cross axle effect, uh, as in two opposite wheels lock out rather than all four. So with DBS on, track lock or, or torque divider pulled in, you'll get equalization to all four wheel motors and then maximum traction. Switch those back off. These extra buttons here, you've got two on the side. These indent and, and, and stick in. And you've got four on the rear, which you just press buttons. You just press and release. They don't, they're not indent, they don't stick in, they don't latch. They're all for the ACI system which is linked to a seven pin socket underneath your multi-connector on the, on the boom. So when you use uh, one of our attachments like a side boom flail or a side shift flail, they've got extra functions. You basically plug everything into the front and then they'll operate off these switches. So you'll switch your flail head on with this, the back buttons you'll use to do your boom functions um, and everything links into this joystick. So you've got all that set up as standard if you ever need it in the future. There are decals everywhere that's showing you what all your different functions are. And now I'm going to come to the switches down here. Okay, first of all, your throttle. If you start the engine with your throttle up full, I'm going to do it now. All you'll get is tick over after 10 seconds. Sorry for the hand, hands everywhere. Um, so the principle there is if you start the engine with throttle engaged, the engine management system will, will not let it rev anyway. It will always start in tick over and it'll stay there. 
10 seconds for the engine management system to just initialize and do what it does. And then if you turn your, thr your, your, your throttle back down to zero, you can now dial in your throttle, but it will always start on tick over no matter what you do. And you'd have to reset, but give it 10 seconds. Here we've got park brake. So park brake will lock out the wheel motors and put and engage brakes, which are on the front two wheel motors only. So if you park on a steep hill facing downhill, the front wheels are locked and they're going to hold the machine. If you park on a steep hill facing uphill, the front two wheel motors are now uphill, the rears don't have a brake, and you can experience a situation where the rears rotate and drag the fronts. So you'll see your machine very, very, very slowly start to creep down a hill. It's controlled, um, but it's not standing still. So always try and park with your park brake with your machine facing downhill, so the front is facing downhill. Also, if you switch your ignition off, your park brake is automatically engaged because it's purely just down to the pressure in the system um, because the brakes are spring applied and pressure released. You've got a horn, you've got work lights, you've got high and low drive speed, and again, you'll get a corresponding light, see if we can get everything on together, um, on your dashboard. So most functions that are going to change something physically to do with how the machine works are linked to a light on the dashboard. In low drive, you'll get torque. In high drive, you'll get speed. You don't get torque if you're in high drive. So you will have situations where you think, I've got no power. Or maybe you're going to go and load up some steep ramps onto a trailer and it doesn't seem to want to go. It's because you've got it in high drive. So just bear that in mind, you get all your pushing force here, you get all your speed here, but you don't get both in either position. Uh, heated seat, the heated seats are okay. They're not, they're not the most powerful in the world. It's not like sitting in a high-end car and having your bum toasted. Um, this switch here is linked to the uh, three-pin socket below your multi-connector on your boom. So this is for uh, if you had a hedge cutter with um, the tilt function for the blade, the blade will tilt by operating this and it, it tilts electrically. We, we'll cover these sorts of things and also the ACI, which is all these buttons, if you have an attachment that's uh, going to need it. Um, this one here gives you effectively two different engine maps. Um, so one will just keep a lid on your RPM, it'll restrict you to 2,200. The other one will release all the RPM. I think, to be honest, this is all really to do with the stage five emissions standard, so that the driver gets the option to run in eco mode effectively. So just consider that. Um, and this one here is your, uh, your DPF, your, your diesel particle filter cleaning. So you can leave this in off, completely off, so you don't use it at all. So you can switch it off if you go indoors, or if you're in an area where if there was a spark that came out of the exhaust, you might ign ignite something. So if you went in a hay barn, switch it off. Um, when DPF kicks in, when the DPF clean kicks in, which it does automatically, there can be the odd spark come out of the exhaust. So this is why you can switch it off if you go into a, an environment where a fire could be started. If you leave it in the center, it'll it's just on auto. So, What's going to happen then is the screen at some point is going to come up with a symbol and the engine's going to start to rev away on you and it's going to automatically go into DPF cleaning mode. Um, so you can just leave your machine to figure it out for itself. Um, if you want to manually DPF clean, press and hold. And um, to be honest, I've not done it, so I don't know what happens on the screen while you're doing it, but when you press and hold, the engine should go into its DPF cleaning phase. Uh, and hold it for, for, for a minute or so. There are full instructions on this in the manual, so I would suggest having a good read of that. You might want to manually do this if you were going to go into an environment where you were then going to switch off so that you will make sure your DPF is clean when you're outside, and then you can go and work away with it switched off. You don't have to worry about your DPF cleaning phase kicking in. And then maybe if you're working indoors or in a hay barn for a long period, when you come back out, you could just do a manual clean again for yourself. Um, but other than that, if you leave it in this position with no lights on, it will automatically do what it needs to do when it needs to do it. And one final thing on controls, there's a little black button here. Um, 
and that is just a button. Sorry, not there, there. I'm looking through the camera, just there. That's your, um, your USB socket, so you can charge something up. Um, but here is the button, the black button I was just talking about. Now that is used to reset the service indicator. So uh, on all of your lights, there is a spanner symbol. Um, I don't know if you'll see it when I just switch on. One of them is a spanner up here. If that spanner light stays on, I'll just do it again, so that it's top right. If that spanner symbol stays on, it means your machine is due a service. And the spanner symbol will come on uh, 10 hours before your service is due. So your first service is 50 hours, the spanner symbol will come on at 40 hours, and it'll stay on when you're running. Um, when the machine's then serviced, we use this little black button, and there's instructions in the back of the manual on how to do it, to reset the service indicator, and it will reset by 200 hours and start counting down for the next service. And that covers everything. It covers all your basics, it covers all the controls, there's nothing more really to think about. There is a preheat position on your key switch. So on, preheat against the spring, and then fire. And then just one last thing just to talk through is, and a few people have got confused about this one. This one on the right is temperature. Some people think it's, <laughs> I've had one or two people where this has gone uh, basically, they've got a problem, they, they, their red lights come on somewhere, they look at this, they think, oh, I'm low of hydraulic oil, it's, it's engine temperature. And the one on the left is your fuel. Uh, you've got a readout for your voltage, and you've got your hours run, and you've got your RPM. The RPM is quite important. If you run an attachment at a later date that spins, there may be a limit as to what oil flow rate you can put through that attachment. And in the manual, there's a chart, and the chart shows you RPM, against flow rate and there's two curves one with high flow on and one with high flow off that's your high flow um, and if your high flow on gives you a flow rate that exceeds the maximum input for the attachment you're going to use then you need to regulate your rpm to no more than uh, what will give that correct output so for example this machine will deliver 83 liters per minute maximum but if you put a flail on the front, a flail only wants to take a maximum of 60 litres a minute. So it's important to check your manual and see what RPM on high flow you hit 60 litres per minute. And then that's the maximum RPM that you run to with your flail running. If in doubt with any of that, just ring us and we'll give you written uh, verification of what to do and what your limits are. Um, and we're probably going to be talking through that with you anyway if you buy an attachment that needs a regulated oil flow. Um, that's everything, everything I can think of. Certainly that's everything from a driver's perspective in the cab. A few tips on driving and, and regulating your foot pedal rather than just using it like the throttle on a car. Um, a little tip about the steering, don't forget, you know, tease everything and the machine will be lovely and smooth. Um, any questions, we're always here, just give us a call.